Greetings. Thank you for coming to a virtual presentation. My name is Michelle Slayton. I'm with the U.S. Forest Service Region 5 Remote Sensing Lab. And I'm going to be speaking about the application of a remote sensing tool to track forest health, especially in high elevation forests. I want to acknowledge my co-authors at the Forest Service Region 5 Remote Sensing Lab and at UC Davis. So I'll start with some background on the ecology of these forests, and then I'm going to talk about our Landsat-based anomaly detection system, the Ecosystem Disturbance and Recovery Tracker, or EDART for short, and especially a new output, a quantitative measure of canopy cover loss in the form of a mortality magnitude index. And finally, our monitoring results. So high elevation forests in California are largely dominated by white pines. These are the five needle pines. They include white bark, western white, limber, foxtail, bristlecone, but also firs, uh, mountain hemlock, and juniper. Our project has focused mainly on white bark pine. And white bark is found only in North America. In California, it's generally over 9,000 feet. It occurs in the Sierra Nevada, the Klamaths, Cascades, and Warners. Uh, white bark's a candidate species under the Endangered Species Act. And so what that means is if it's listed, the activities in its habitat, which includes over 200,000 acres in California, are going to be affected. That's ski areas, roads, reservoir infrastructure. Now, whether or not it's listed, land managers are going to be likely obligated to monitor it over the upcoming year. And so that's what's driving this project. The two main disease agents we're interested in are mountain pine beetle, a native species that's had significant impacts since 2010, all up and down the state. Blister rust is a non-native pathogen. Uh, it has yet to become as severe as we've seen in the Rocky Mountains, but it's a big unknown risk for white bark in California. And that's another reason that we need an effective monitoring method. So EDART, the Ecosystem Disturbance and Recovery Tracker, is our highly automated Landsat-based processing system for land change mapping. Our paper on the algorithm was published last year in Remote Sensing of the Environment, that's there on the right. And we use data going back into the 1980s. It's all at the 30 meter scale and with new images every couple of weeks. The main bands and vegetation indices that we use are there on the right, including NDVI, but also the normalized burn ratio and normalized difference infrared index. And runs are performed at the extent of those scenes that you see in that figure. EDAR products give information on disturbance events, namely their timing and severity. And the algorithm's complex, so very briefly, we use regression to identify anomalies, or uh, you can think of them as regime changes with respect to a recent temporal baseline and also with respect to a contextual spatial class. Think uh, coarse land cover types. So that contextual change is largely what sets EDART apart from similar algorithms. That's what really tells you if the change is an anomaly as compared to all the background in that land cover type. We then use forward and backward filtering uh, to identify discrete events. And those are disturbances like fire, harvest, and tree mortality. So a quick demo of what EDART's high temporal resolution gets you. The next few slides show expansion of insect-related mortality over a couple of years. 2017, shown here, had a fair amount of loss. It progressed outward uh, the next year and by the end of 2018, even more. So next up uh, is the topic of quantifying the magnitude of these events. And until recently, we've had to rely on the regression residuals from those events I just described. So in other words, the value 
of a band as compared to its expected baseline. And that, that is really a reasonable proxy for the magnitude of change, and that's what's shown here. But our new method is a more direct measure of canopy loss using an empirically trained model. So as an overview, we create training data of measured canopy loss using high-res imagery like NAEP or Google Earth. We then extract Landsat spectral information and use regression to model and create outputs of cover loss across whole landscapes. Now, the modeling is kind of like solving a puzzle. If you picture a time series of Landsat images with the mortality event starting in that red frame in the center there, we have to not only figure out which spectral bands capture the change, but how to integrate that information over time, right? Like in that photo in the upper right, stands are most typically in these mixed conditions. Here's a close-up of assessing change in a single pixel. Uh, so a highly experienced map analyst assign ocular estimates of live canopy cover on two different dates uh, for which we have high-res imagery um, available both before and after a known EDART event. We then compute the change in that pixel, uh, in other words, delta canopy cover. And in this example, you can see that 30% of the live canopy was lost during that time. We then use beta regression for the modeling. This is a method that constrains response values uh, between zero and one. And so it's well suited for proportional data to make sure you don't end up with crazy predicted values over 100% or less than zero. And uh, so delta canopy cover was the response variable. And we tested lots of Landsat bands and BIs as predictors. The one here that I haven't mentioned yet is that RGA, the red-green angle. And that's a trigonometric function of red and green bands that basically measures vegetation brownness. And then just to revisit those questions in the orange box, we had to figure out temporally what was the best way to integrate images to represent the magnitude of change. So those questions are lined out here. Um, how many images should be used? What season? Should we try to match the timing gap that we had between the training images? Does the variance matter? It's really this balance game on the one hand, more images might sound better because you get a better average, but going out further in time means you might incorporate more disturbance. So we took an empirical approach of testing all possible model combinations. And that's what that gigantic number is that you see up there. <laughs> and here's the result for our selected model. This is showing the observed value on the y and the predicted value on the x. The root mean square error of the model is 13%. So that means on average, our predictions are within 13% of the true value. I'm not going to get into the weeds of the model there at the bottom. But for any diehards, I, I wanted to put the details on this slide to let you dive in as interest uh, and time might allow. And here are the results uh, predicted out at the whole raster scale. So this is canopy cover loss across a whole scene in the southern Sierra Nevada with the highest percentages in red. And we're in the process of creating these outputs for all forested lands in California. Uh, oops. So here I'm zooming into uh, high elevation white bark and limber pine. And this slide is showing the upward progression in elevation from 2016 through 2018, with the ability now in that MMI to see the percent canopy cover loss in each separate year. Uh, and in 2018 on the right, showing the cumulative loss in that year. And these are the statewide results with cover loss over time by these binned classes. Now, 
the image below is one spot that represents uh, the pattern that you're seeing in this bar graph. So higher cover loss, those are the darker bars up above, really peaked in 2010 uh, through 2012 with events like June Mountain and uh, the Warners where we had huge mortality events and very dense forests. But over time, as the beetles move mostly upward, uh, they're, they're starting to exhaust some of those denser forests. And so, so we're seeing a little uptick more recently in those sparser forests. Uh, that's partly due to the beetle activity spreading out from those big events along you know, the narrow edge of those mortality events, but also all up and down the state, really just these very dispersed mortality events in, in a pretty narrow high elevation band uh, where the forests are pretty sparse. And the last thing I'll mention is the field-based validation campaign we've had underway to see if the mortality magnitude index, uh, which was actually trained mostly in lower elevation conifers, is in fact performing well in these forests. So we'll be using these results to fine tune our model eco-regionally or possibly to elevation zone specific models. And with that, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, this project's been a huge team effort. I really want to thank our whole group at uh, the Remote Sensing Lab and also folks in the Region 5 Ecology Program and Forest Health Protection, uh, most especially the funding they provided through a special technology development grant, and also an amazing hardworking field crew. Thank you.